Hi, welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Every so often, a book like Jemima J, a novel of ugly ducklings and swans, comes along and changes the way a new generation writes, or even the way a generation reads. We have the creator of that book and many other bestsellers with us today, Jane Green. Jane, we're so excited to have you on the show. Thank you again for joining us. Hi! You've spoken of the library being a refuge of sorts for you as a child. Take viewers on a tour of the shelves and the authors that first helped you fall in love with reading. So, so the first library that I really remember very clearly was actually my, um, my school library in elementary, the equivalent in London, in England, um, to elementary school. And it was this very small room with carpet and wooden stacks, of, wooden stacks, you know, filled with books and bean bags. And you actually, you would go to the library when we had recess, if it was raining, which obviously it does an awful lot in England, um, we were allowed to have recess in the library. And I remember curling up on bean bags and I'd pull these books from shelves and, and all, so many of them were American actually, you know, Laura Ingalls Wilder and, and the, um, the What Katie Did um, series, I think it's Susan Cooper, and then Nancy yeah. Mitford. And, and I would just lose myself in other worlds that seemed just so much better than mine, just more exciting or happier. Um, and I was very much a child who, who didn't feel that she, that she fit in. I mean, I was a child, I was very shy, I was introverted. Um, and I, I didn't feel very, um, I didn't feel very loved. And I didn't feel that I was, I, I didn't feel enough actually is just the simplest way of, of saying it. So the place that gave me the greatest escape and the place where I found my solace and my joy was always within the pages of books. Um, so that was really, I think, how it, it started. And, um, and I think that's true for many writers. You know, we, we become writers because we, we are readers. When you got to university, what kind of expanded exposure did you have to new authors that further excited you about writing? I think that I, I, I was, you know, painfully insecure as a child, I'm shy. And then I think when I went to university, you know, I always wanted to go to boarding school. Um, my brother, because, because my home life was difficult. It was, you know, my brother was at boarding school. Uh, so it was just me in the house with my parents. And it was just, it was difficult. I, I was not an easy child. Um, my parents weren't natural parents and and there was a lot of clashing and there was a lot of fighting and and i always sort of had this sense that if i could get away uh things would get better and so i was desperate to go to boarding school um i mean i will say now you know i love my parents i speak okay and actually you know i'm i'm moving back to london for a year partly to spend time with my parents but um I, I do know, because my brother is also kind of wildly successful in his, in his field. And I think part of that is that we were raised by wolves. We, we weren't, we were not, we just didn't have a lot of attention and we, and, and we were left to our own devices. And so I think it may, in my, I can really speak for me, it made me enormously um, resilient and self-sufficient and, ambitious because I was the invisible child and I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be heard. I didn't have a voice as a child. Did you have the proverbial aha moment while at school that made you decide you wanted to pursue journalism and writing as a career? I, I wish that I had a, a game plan and I had a whole design, but the truth is <laughs> I, fe I fell into journalism um, and it was just, I had a job. I was kind of an, a marketing assistant um, and, and I used to rewrite everyone's stuff and I remember my my boss saying you know what you should really be a writer and he had a girlfriend who worked for um, a magazine in London called Just 17 and he said I'm going to introduce you because I I think you should be writing and that was really that was the first thing that I ever had published it was it was just I think I, I don't even think it was an article I think it was like a fun quiz like a pop <laughs> quiz but they printed it and I, and I got paid for it and I saw my name in print how inspiring was that moment to see something in print for the first time that you'd written? Oh my God, it was, it was, I mean, I was 21 years old and, and it was, it was crazy. And then 
I joined a, um, I went to work for a, a features agency who at the time it was like celebrity interviews. So we'd go to all the press junkets and just, you know, steal the stars of whatever TV shows and, and, and try and get a story out of them. Um, and, and I was really rubbish at that. I was, because I'm, I'm actually too, I think I'm too compassionate to be a good journalist. I, I would never, and there were times when I'd get great stories and I think I can't, I know they didn't mean to tell me that. Like, I know they told me that because we were getting on and I know it would destroy them if I printed it. So I, yeah, I was rubbish. Really, that's not what you want in a journalist. But actually I ended up landing um, on a national newspaper in London, the okay. Daily Express. And, um, and I ended up as a feature writer. And that was when I really discovered, God, I, I not just that I love writing, but that it comes very naturally and easily to me. So, you know, that I became, I became the, the person that they initially, I got the job, um, I, you know, my editor changed and the editor who brought me in left and a new editor came in with her whole team. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm going to lose my job. And I said to her, can we go and get tea this afternoon? And we went and got tea and I said, look, I, I really love working here. I'd love to stay. She said, well, I don't think I've got anything for you to do. You need to start looking for another job. And by the end of that week, I'd made myself indispensable because I was the girl that you could come to and go, Jane, we need a thousand words on ankle bracelets in an hour. And I just did it. I, I, it, it just was, I would just find it very easy to write. And I particularly liked writing the longer pieces. And then of course, there I was in my twenties, single, living in London, you know, just dating up a storm, having fun. And, and so I write about it. Um, and, and then, um, well, that, I mean, that was how, that was what led to my first novel to straight talking. What were a few of the skill sets you picked up as a journalist that stuck with you when you transitioned into your novel writing career? The things that the the main thing I learned as a journalist, I think, is that writing is a job. Because when you have somebody standing over you every day saying, We need a thousand words on this in an hour, you can't say, Well, I'm I'm so sorry, but I'm not inspired today. You can't you you have to do it because it's your job. And and I think the dis it taught me the discipline of writing because honestly. I, you know, I, uh, for years and I, I, I think now uh, I've reached 52, at 52 years old, I finally realized that I'm quite good at what I do, but I didn't, I thought, you know what, I'm just, I'm very lucky. I wrote the right book at the right time. And any day now, somebody's going to pick up my next book and think, oh, she's a, she's a fraud. She can't she can't do that. and I really believe I really believed I was lucky rather than good and I'm, I'm only it's only recently that I've begun to to actually realize well you you don't get to have you know 18 New York Times bestsellers if you're just lucky um and it's not you know it's it's luck it's talent it's a huge amount of hard work and it's discipline you became a best-selling author overnight with Straight Talking, but it was really the now iconic Jemima J, a novel about swans and ugly ducklings that made you an overnight superstar. Take viewers back to the original inspiration for that wonderful book. The truth is, Jemima J, I was never a hundred pounds overweight, but I was I was an overweight kid, and I was a kid who who was chubby, but was constantly put on diets and told that I I was you know that I had to lose weight and I I had to. Um, I was not good enough. And so, and actually, you know, Jemima's story was really my story um, and really how, how I felt. I think, I also think that Jemima as a character had, had a sweetness that was really relatable. Um, she was just a good person and, and she wanted just a very si simple life and wanted to be seen. Um, and I think just so many women related to that and young women. And I, I still get letters from 12 year old girls, you know, young teens and preteens, because we, so many of us feel that we're just not enough. And that's really what, what your mind is about. It's about a woman who doesn't feel enough, who then realizes that it's okay to not be enough. You can still go for the things that you want. Jemima is a really common name in the UK. It, um, um, so I know here, people think of Aunt Jemima Pancakes, but actually Jemima is one of those very traditional English names. Um, 
And actually, my, um, my working title for the book was always Jemima Jones. And then I remember my editor saying, well, we can't call it Jemima Jones because Bridget Jones's diary has just come out. So Straight Talking was the first book I wrote, which was a big bestseller in the UK. But the book, but the book that was really huge was my second book, was the first book to be published here, which was Jemima J. Um, and Jemima J was the Cinderella story updated. And, and it was, I, I went to LA to write it. I had the best time. I remember the, the very first thing that, it, that inspired it was, um, was my roommate. Um, I, I was working for a TV company at the time um, and I was living in, in Manchester and I had this roommate and she was very, very small and very, very wide. And, and she actually was, was, I mean, she clearly had struggles with food. You know, we'd find food wrappers everywhere. And, and, but she was also incredibly self-possessed. And actually the very beginnings of Jemima J was, I wanted to write about her. I mean, I wanted to write about a woman like her. Um, but in fact, and this is what so often happens, you, you start writing thinking, thinking that a character is going a certain way and, and almost immediately it becomes a completely different character what happened so Jemima was supposed to be this this you know self-possessed sexy overweight woman but actually she became this this kind of uh, the invisible she became what I was as a child she became an invisible woman um and she who felt that nobody could see past her her excess weight to see who she was and the beauty that that lay within and then of course she goes through this whole Cinderella transformation ugly duckling into a swan, but a swan who she just transfers one eating disorder, overeating to the opposite, to kind of, you know, anorexia and, and sort of learns that actually the way to happiness is obviously is balance. Um, but that book was an enormous bestseller here. How did it feel when you walked into a bookstore, either in Britain or in the US to see your book for sale on shelves? That's such a special moment for any author. Yeah, that was amazing. But um, with my very first books with Straight Talking, there was a lot of press around the book. And, and that, so I'd been on the other side. I was always the journalist and all of a sudden I was being interviewed. And, and I remember feeling very exposed and very vulnerable. And I, I remember doing um, the Daily Mail, did a big piece and I remember they, they wanted a photograph of me lying on a chaise in a red evening dress, surrounded by a bunch of, of male models in, in black tie, feeding me grapes and champagne. And it was the cheesiest thing I had ever heard in my life. And I remember being horrified by the prospect and saying, I'm, I, I can't do that. And them saying, well, if you don't do that, we won't run the piece. And I remember thinking, oh, well, I have to. So I was sort of, I felt like I was forced into doing this, this awful photo shoot where I just felt I just, I felt really uncomfortable. And that was a really good lesson because now I say no, if I'm not comfortable, I, nothing is worth, you know, your discomfort in that, in that way. Or, and also how you, I mean, I, I'm very, one of the great joys of, of being this age and still writing is that I really know who I am now. I didn't know who I was earlier. I was trying to be someone else. I think my writing was always, has always been authentic because that's actually how I've, how I express myself. Um, but now I'm able to bring that authenticity to everything. Like who you see is, this is me. I'm, I'm not being anyone else. I'm, I'm very honest. I'm very down to earth. Um, and and I, I like that I'm, I'm leading a really authentic life now. And so, um, yeah, I'm never going to be coerced into doing a, a photo shoot in an evening gown again. <laughs> Once you became a best-selling author, did it take long for you to adjust to the inevitable public side of that fame? I think for a long time, I didn't know how to be a best-selling author. I kind of felt like, oh, I'm now a best-selling author. I have to look a certain way. I have to act a certain way. I remember thinking very clearly, I need to move to America with this book because if America's going to make a commitment to me, I have to make a commitment to America. And I moved here to ride that wave. And, and I did ride that wave for a very long time. What my advice, I mean, it, 
look, I don't regret it, of course not, but it's almost, it's impossible to live up to that kind of success when out the gate. You kind of think when you're young, I mean, I was 20, I don't know, 27, you think, oh, this is just the beginning. I'm going to be earning more and more and I'm going to be, this is only, this. I just, it never occurred to me that at some point my <laughs> My numbers would drop or my career would struggle. Um, so I think my, the, my best advice is always to people who have huge success early on, put your money away. You have not won the lottery. Do not do what I did and spend it. That's amazing advice and so true. Still, that book really did change the way people talked about body image issues and really felt about it after reading it and really for the first time. When you were following that book up, what kind of pressure were you feeling? Uh, the first thing, the the eating disorder and overweight women, you know, Jemima inspired a very strong reaction in people. So whilst there there were millions of women who love that book and who write to me still today to say that book was the book that changed their lives, there are there were many women who absolutely hated it because they didn't understand the me the message was never you have to be thin, the message was was you have to be happy with yourself. It doesn't actually matter what weight you are, but but it was it was misinterpreted, I think, by a lot of women. And there are women who to this day hate that book. There are also women who for whom it, you know life has changed. That was the beginning of a of a few tumultuous years where it was the first time I had different titles in the UK and in the US. And it led to them thinking it was okay to have different titles going forward. But of course, the internet made that impossible. I still, in fact, I had an angry letter from somebody this week who had bought, um, well, which one had she bought? She bought Dune Road and then she, and then she, it had another title in the UK. I can't remember what it was called in the UK, but she realized that it was um, the same book that she'd already read it. And she felt that often people feel like I'm trying to pull one over on them. I'm deliberately putting out books with different titles because I'm trying to get people to spend, spend money twice. Um, anyway, um, so actually what happened with that was I called the book Life Swap and I was in a meeting with, um, I think it was Simon and Schuster who I was talking to at the time. And the guy said, hey, did you ever read that book? Because uh, I was describing the book and it was called Life Swap. And he said, hey, did you ever read that book, Life Swap? I went, what book, Life Swap? He said, oh, there was a book written in the 70s about a woman in New York who actually did this. She, she swapped lives with someone, um, but like with husbands and boyfriends and like everything. They literally just sort of swapped. And she wrote a memoir about it. And so I found this book, I tracked this book down and I got it and I started to read it. And, and it, it was, to, I mean, mine was fiction. It was totally different. Um, but I had the book on my bookshelf. And when the book was, I guess, coming out and I'd given an interview and they photographed me with my bookshelves behind me and the author of that book who had never written anything subsequent to that, then trademarked the title series and, and issued a cease and desist. And, and they said, well, look, we think that you would win, but is it a fight you wanna have? And we just decided it's just not worth the fight. And so we changed the title here to Swapping Lives. How important did you feel it was in your early career to have a supportive editor, especially following up a phenomenon like Jemima J? Uh, the editor question is a really big question because I think times have changed enormously. Um, so, you know, when I started, and Jemima J was published here 20, 20 actually 20 years ago this year. Um, and back in the day, you had an editor, I mean, often you'd have an editor for life, you know, really back in the day, but you'd have your editor was, was, your, was the person at the helm of a big team at the publishing houses and your editor sort of oversaw everything. And you developed these incredible relationships. I mean, I, I had the same editor for many, many years in the UK and, and she was so much more than an editor. She was a mentor, she was a friend. Um, you know, she was the first person I turned to for advice on everything. Louise Moore. And she's now the head of Michael Joseph, which is one of the imprints at um, Penguin Random House. 
Um, but I think today, I mean, I've, I, I've been really, really lucky and I've worked with some really smart editors, but that I don't think there's the same loyalty and I don't think editors are able to fight for their authors anymore. You, they used to be able to fight. And so if things if weren't working or if an author felt strongly or if the editor felt strongly, they could have that fight. And now they can't because it's all about the bottom line and it's all, it's all about the sales and the money. And so if the sales team says, well, we don't like that title, it's not going to sell. They go, oh, okay, we're, we're going to change that title. Or if the sales team or whoever says, well, we don't like that she's dealing with abortion in this, you know, they're going to say, we need you to take that out. And, 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 and then when the book comes out, if the book isn't working, um, I think what happens very often is that I think in, in the old days, they could, they were able to fight for a book more. Whereas now it's just, well, that's not working. All right, well, let's abandon that. And we'll, we'll move on to something that is working. And publishing is, is, really hard and everybody wants to make make a success and no one knows what the formula is and and people are buying less and less books and so I I I understand why it happens um excuse me but I I still feel incredibly lucky to have worked with amazing people and and I I hope I will continue to do so the other thing you had back in the day was a big marketing and PR team and and they and they did everything so your job your only job was to write a great book also there was no internet there was no social media today your job is to write a great book it's also to write various supporting you know articles blogs short stories whatever you interviews whatever you can to sort of spread the word it's also your job to keep an instagram and a twitter and a facebook live year round um and it really kind of has to be you because the readers know the difference if it's not you and it's just endless marketing that you really are expected to do kind of pretty much your, all your own marketing and and it's just really hard work and really time consuming and and there are times when i think yeah i can do this and i'm gonna i'm gonna post every day and there are other times when i just think i i've got nothing to say i can't be bothered i don't do this anymore Second Chance was another very popular title from your early catalog, and Tom's death is so central to the rest of the story. It reminded me of The Big Chill. Did it have any real-life muse? Yeah, I, you know, Second Chance remains, to this day, um, my husband's favorite of all my books, for exactly those reasons. And, and he always says it's just like The Big Chill. Um, and I love The Big Chill. I mean, The Big Chill is a great movie. Um, I think that was that was really my first sort of on what I think of as an ensemble book. Like it has, it's a book with an ensemble cast, which I realize are my favorite books to write. That that's just what I re I like delving into multiple stories. I I I'm, I'm not so comfortable with with one person. Um, and it came. I I lost. Um, I mean, not a close friend, but somebody I really adored and who was very present in my life in the tsunami um and uh and i think that was really that was that was where tom's tom came from yeah the beach house i understand was based on a real life love story happening behind the scenes in your own life is that right so so what so i had met my husband by then i i was divorced i had four young children um and then i rented this little beach house and fell you know, madly in love with my landlord, who is now my husband. Um, and he took me to Nantucket for the first time. And I adored Nantucket. But even more than that, I, I realized, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm going to London now, in or you have to live enough of a life in order to have something to write about. And that means that Every new experience I've had has inspired me in some way. And the more that I'm able to travel or go to different places or meet different people, the more inspired, the more it sparks my creativity. So the beach house, I mean, initially it was, you know, I was falling in love with my landlord 
And we'd go for these walks every night on the beach once the kids were in bed. And every night at about midnight, the same woman would pass us and she'd be riding a bicycle with a cigarette in one hand. And she was in her late sixties with sort of long white hair and red lipstick at midnight by herself. And I was fascinated by her. And I remember just thinking, I, I need to write a book about her. And it, it came at the same time as, as my, my falling in love with the island of Nantucket. So that, that was really where the beach house came from. So there are times where there's some art imitating life woven throughout your books. I imagine it's that way for a lot of novelists though. So I, I draw from my life without ever writing about my life. Um, and uh, I, I think, well, when you're drawing from your life, it's, there is absolute authenticity. You know, you, you've, you have a real understanding of what you're writing about. But I'm, I'm never going to tell my story because, it, it, I mean, I'm not going to tell my whole life because um, I have written a non, I mean, I am writing, one of my projects right now is a non-fiction book. But even then, yeah, I'm careful. I just wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put my life in. But it's, a, it's very tricky because people think they know you from reading your books. And, it, and also, if they see a glimmer of truth, if they see things that they know to be true about your life, they mm -hmm. then presume that it's all true about your life. And actually, one of my favorite examples of that is Tempting Fate. Um, and, you know, Tempting Fate was, was uh, I went off to a, a book conference and found myself um, sitting with a very young, handsome author who was incredibly flirtatious. And, and, <laughs> He emailed me after the event and we had this email back and forth for a while. And, and, you know, I'm married to my landlord from the, you know, the beach house who is the greatest man in the world. And I have a really happy marriage. And, you know, I remember thinking, Oh my God, this is how affairs start. It's because nobody would think of themselves as somebody who would have an affair. You don't want to have an affair. You just want one more text. You just want to feel attractive again you want to feel relevant and noticed and beautiful and alive and and you know all marriages after a while become pots and pans and to have somebody you know young and attractive pay you attention like i get it i got it for the first time how there didn't have to be a problem in the marriage that sometimes you can just want one more text, one more email, and all of a sudden you find yourself at a precipice. And so that became the story of a woman who was in a really happy marriage, but who ended up making a very big mistake that blew her life apart. Taking Ted Chapman from Saving Grace, please talk a little bit about your approach to creating a lead character on the page. I, so I think, you know, I remember years ago when I very first started, a friend of mine said, if you take care of the characters, they will tell their own stories. And I've always got into trouble when I put more focus on the plot, because when I put more, when I try and write, like, you know, those series of books were written with an amazing editor, actually, and I adored working with her, uh, Jen Enderlin at St. Martin's. She, yeah, she's totally fantastic. She's the master of the, the psychological thriller. And... And we worked very closely together and she took me in more of a thriller direction. But I always feel like I lose a little bit of my characters when I'm doing that. I get too focused on the plot and I would rather really know my, know my characters and almost let them tell their own stories. I always have an idea. But if you leave me to my own devices to write my books, I follow a very traditional Greek three act structure. I always have a vague idea of, you know, I know that, that you've got the beginning, the middle and the end. I know that at the end of act one, you're going to have a dramatic plot point, something that, that's, you know, spins you into act two and, and this, you know, then you're going to build to the climax at the end of act two. And I know that my resolution is, all, is always the same thing. It's about, it tends to be about people who are, who are finding their place in the world and finding peace, um, you know, and, and just a place to call home. And I never quite know, I, I sort of know the theme, I know the message, but I never quite know how they're going to get there. That just, it, that work, and I have worked where I've done very detailed storylines and outlined every chapter and followed it almost like writing by numbers. 
I don't like that as much. I'd rather be surprised and let the characters take me where they where they will. So Saving Grace was, you know, this is the truth is all of my books are inspired by something in my life. Then none of them are completely my story, but all of them have a the, the spark of inspiration comes from something in my life. And in saving with saving grace, I I'd had a period of time where I was misdiagnosed um, with something and, and given a whole lot of pills that I should not have been taking um, that that kind of destroyed my life for a while. Um, and and I I was reading so many articles at the time about um, I mean I was misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder you know and I, I know many people with bipolar disorder I am not one of them and I, I knew that that was not actually the correct diagnosis in fact it ended up that I had um, I'd had Lyme disease for, for oh, a geez. long time and had all the various sort of autoimmune things that come with Lyme but but I think uh, it was sort of easier to say well she's mentally ill um and i ended up on lithium which was oh which, my God. You know, is a is a great drug i think if you need it but was a if you're not bipolar so you know i i was um i actually had been had had i have adhd and and then i i ended up on lithium i mean on a cocktail of drugs including lithium um and i didn't get out of bed for for a year um, and just felt absolutely hopeless, just lost interest and passion in everything. Um, and that was where Saving Grace came about. You know, Grace, who, who goes through many of the challenges that I had gone through. But of course, you know, Grace's life was not my life. Grace's story is not my story, but it just drawn from my, my life. You've always had your own wonderful way with words, whether it's with narrative or description or dialogue. Please pull the curtain back for viewers a little bit on how that works as you're actually creating in the midst of writing. Actually, dialogue, I think, just comes from character. And I think you kind of, it, it either comes naturally to you or you don't. That wasn't something okay. that I learned as a feature writer. And I, it just happens to be something that I really like doing. But I, th I think that's about empathy, actually. And and one of the things that that, is required to be a writer of these kinds of novels is empathy without judgment and and I think you know I, I, in fact Ellen Hildebrand was you know we did an event together a few years ago and she was the one that said that it, it just but it, it encapsulates it and that's what you need and when you empathize with the human condition with people who are doing terrible things you're you're you can still find compassion and understanding you're then able to Put yourself in their shoes and, and speak as them and that's what I do I I have shared an office with people and apparently I literally sit and as I type I'm muttering I'm laughing I'm I mean I'm I'm acting it out and I have no idea I think I'm completely quiet but they all find it hilarious because I am literally acting it out. I will cry I will, I will giggle. I mean, I, I just, I act the whole thing out in my head, which I think, I think how the dialogue comes about. With all those voices talking and the rest of the story going on as you're writing, do you prefer to have silence or music playing? I do listen to music, but only, I can only listen to sort of ambient or classical. I can't listen to anything with lyrics or it pulls me away. Um, although actually, when I was writing in Table for One, which is a, a book that hasn't yet been published, that I may have mentioned earlier, there's a scene in at a like a really cool hip. It's all Silicon Valley, so it's it's Silicon Valley, and it's all these young people in California, and there's this great outdoor party, and and to write the party, I listened to this this DJ's kind of mixtape, like really cool kind of Ibiza chill music that just got me in in the absolute right headspace um and 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 in fact writing the book I'm writing now which is all set in 60s London um I don't listen to it necessarily while I'm writing but I definitely I, I've got that music around me a lot um you know, the rock particularly the Rolling Stones right now um which is weird because I'm I was never a Rolling Stones fan <laughs> but, but um they have become an in, integral part of this book um so i you know it's funny for years and years i didn't write at home but pre-covid i'd have to leave my house i felt like i needed a routine okay. i needed to feel that i was going to work for years i went to the library then i 
I went to a writing room, then I had a co-working space, um, and then COVID hit, and I went into shock and couldn't write anything, and then thought, how the hell am I going to do this if I can't leave my house? And then I came up with a great idea. I, it's not even that I came up with a great idea. I started writing a story that I'd wanted to tell for years, and I'm so passionate about it that, um, that I suddenly found that, hey, that story I told myself for 20 years that I was no longer able to write at home is not true. I've rewritten that story because I am now able to write at home. So I, I put on noise cancelling headphones if there's, if there's noise around me, if, if people are around me. You know, for a long time, when I was raising the kids when they were younger, I would, I would write in the mornings, I was always done by lunchtime. I'd set myself a word count and I was very disciplined. And actually there's been something lovely through COVID because I've got nowhere else to be. I mean, none of us have anywhere to be. And so my writing day has now become all day. And so I start much later. I used to be at my desk by nine. Now, sometimes I'll be there 11 or 12, sometimes one, but I'll write until, and you know, my husband usually brings me in a drink at five. Um, and so, and, you know, right until I, until it's time to start making dinner. I just yeah. keep on writing. And, and so then I welcome the distractions. I don't mind the distractions because I know like I've got the whole day and, and if I write all evening, if I'm, you know, on a roll, I'm going to, I'm going to keep writing all evening and I'm loving this book. And it's also because it's, it's, the book is all, you know, 60s London and Marrakesh and it's rock and roll and it's drugs and it's excess in every way. I'm like, yeah, I like writing later in the day. I should really be getting up all night and writing, but you never know, that might happen. As you continue to invent really memorable characters and new bestsellers like the Sunshine Sisters, what did you most enjoy about coloring the canvas with new characters as they came to you? So the Sunshine Sisters, which is the story of a very difficult narcissistic mother, you know, who has no maternal skills at all, is probably some, you know, on that borderline personality disorder spectrum, has three girls who, she's so volatile, she, she rages. And, and so the, you know, the girls grow up, not only estranged from their mother, but estranged from, from each other. Um, and we, we go back to their childhood and we meet them again as adults when she's, the mother has been diagnosed with ALS. And actually, my original idea for the story was that the girls would come together to help her take her own life. And the original title was The Hemlock Sisters, which I still prefer. I think The Hemlock Sisters is just dark. And, <laughs> and I, I wanted it to be a bit darker. But see, this is one of the things that happens with publishing is that because books, book sales are much higher in the summer, they will often try and, and squeeze books that might not necessarily be beach, you know, they're not beachy, they don't have a beach thing, but, and often I've known many authors who have written about some really dark subjects and they've had a cover slapped on that's, you know, a woman gazing out over water and, and it's very misleading. Um, so the Sunshine Sisters, they wanted a more summary title and something lighter. So I figured, well, let's, let's give, let's make my character Ronnie Sunshine. And then that covers the girls. When, in your opinion, is it appropriate for an author to go up against a publisher in a marketing decision, say concerning a title of a book or its cover? One of the great things about age and wisdom is that I used to think I knew better and I didn't know better. Um, and so I think I just keep my mouth shut now. And actually, but that's something really important. You have to be with people you trust. And, and I've been with many different publishers. You know, unfortunately I've been with a few agents and, and you have to have absolute trust in the people you're working with because otherwise you're always second guessing them. And that, and the truth is, you know, I've, I've, I've worked with brilliant people, but I've also worked with people where I, I've second guessed and, and I've got it wrong because of course I've got it wrong. I don't know. How would I know? The Friends We Keep is a beautiful read. Is it true though that you actually wrestled a little bit with this book during its writing? The Friends We Keep was one of one of my harder books and I I don't know my 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 heart was in bits of it but it wasn't in the whole thing. That's that's the discipline of journalism. That's sitting your butt in the chair giving yourself a word count, 
And even when you, you just think I've got nothing to say, you do not leave your desk until those words are on the page. Because of course, a first draft is only a first draft. You can go in and you can edit it. But the truth is I now realize if I'm not bringing energy to the page, it's just not gonna be as good. And I, I'd forgotten that, but now that I'm working on what I'm working with, I wake up every morning and I'm like, I'm excited to sit down and see what my characters are going to do. And I have a brainstorming, I mean, I actually, I, I have a partner and we're, we're about to work on um, a, a script together. We're script doctoring. We were approached by a, a, a producer in Hollywood who needed um, sort of actually Jane Greening of a, of a script. And I, yeah, and I have a, a writing partner who we work, she's a writer as well. And we, we often brainstorm together and it's the most fun that, that I can have when you're writing a book that you love and you have somebody and you talk and that's actually what a great editor gives you I mean I'm writing this book without an editor right now um but when you have a great editor that brainstorming and the, the first time I ever did that was was when I um Pam Dorman was my editor she's at Penguin Pam Dorman books um Penguin Random House she did uh Promises to Keep which is the love verb in the UK um, and she used to get she used to come up to Westport and in Connecticut and we'd go out for lunch and she'd talk about my characters as if they were real people and she'd be like well what what about what do you what would they do next and I'd be like what if they did oh oh, oh what if and, and you go back and forth like this with these ideas just bursting and and you know when it's right and it's just enormous enormous fun so right now I reached a stage in this book that I'm writing where all my characters have just, um, they've just landed in Morocco. And I, and I got to Morocco and I was like, oh, now I'm stuck. I don't know what to do now. And instead of doing what I think I've probably done with books like The Friends We Keep, where I just sort of battled through by myself trying to figure it out, um, you know, I get together with my writing partner and we're like, oh, whoa. Well, Oh, what about the chauffeur? The chauffeur's going to do this, that, you know. And, and now, I mean, I'm actually, I'm moving on Sunday, which is killing me because all I want to be doing is writing because these, these people are alive in my head and I have so much energy with this book. And I think that's, that's huge, actually. You've got to be alive in order to write. You know, it goes back to that thing that I said earlier about you have to live enough of a life in order to have something to write about. So if you're feeling flat, your writing's going to be flat. And that means get out there, do something different, step out of your comfort zone, do anything you can that you wouldn't normally do just to have new experiences that are going to wake you up, snap you, snap you out of whatever funk you're in and bring that energy to the writing. Do you feel for aspiring authors that it's important to treat your lead and supporting cast characters with equal weight during writing? There's always one main protagonist, but I, I think I don't see them in my head as being less than. Yeah, so they're, they're as alive, they're as important. I think if I saw them as less than, they, they would feel that, you would feel that in the book. You have to do the same amount of work. You, you have, in order to, for, for your voice to be authentic when you're writing people, you have to know them inside and out. And, and I will, I, I, I used to do an exercise, you know, when I teach and I, I haven't taught for a while, um, but when I used to teach, I would often give an exercise where, where I'd ask people to, to, to recall somebody, it could be somebody in the room, pick someone in the room that they didn't know, or just somebody they'd seen that morning. And then, and then I'd give a list of questions. What did they have for breakfast? Who's their family? Who did they speak to on the phone yesterday? And, and that's how you build a character. For me, I love that because it gives you a visual marker. And I always like to start with a visual marker. I have to know what people look like in order to write about them. And so often I will think about somebody that I know or that I've seen to, to use as a, jumping, as a jumping off point for a character. Do you tend to sketch any aspects of your books out before you begin writing them? I don't do, um, I don't have a whiteboard. I don't do index. I probably should. I don't use any fancy, or I don't know. Um, I'm a total Luddite. I'm trying to find my notebook to show you. I'm a total Luddite. Um, obviously, as you can see, I'm a big fan of pink. Not in everything, in, you know, just like a, a, a notebook. But I tend to, to have like, 
a notebook around this size. It's usually pink or red. And I, and I scribble. Yeah, so it's really old school. It's the notes are all over the page and, but I know what they mean and I know what they're saying. And I actually, every day before I start writing on my computer and I, I write on my laptop, I will sit with my notepad and, and map out what's happening that day. It must be touching to know that your books are playing the same role in your readers' lives that authors that you grew up reading did back when you first discovered them as an escape. There's just something extraordinary about meeting readers and seeing how you've touched their lives, whether it's other writers, whether it's readers. But, you know, what people forget is that writing is such an incredibly solitary profession that you're, you know, writing in a little writing room or the library or at your desk. And it's very lonely. And, and yes, I'm an introvert, but I'm also an introvert that loves people. And... And just seeing how how your your work touches people. Somebody asked me this the other day in an interview. You know, what was it like the first time you saw somebody reading your book? And I said, you know what? Well, it's it's as wonderful today as it was back then. And I still get goosebumps. There is still. I mean, I've been writing now for twenty five years, and. If I see somebody on a train or a plane or, and, and I see that, and sometimes I'm like, oh, I, I think like I, I get a flash of the cover. Yeah, it's, it's, look, I think knowing that you're sitting in your office and I'm just writing my truth. You know, I'm, I'm writing how I see the world. And I, I very much believe that you, whatever book you pick up, you know, fiction you still see into the soul of the writer you, you know especially in, in my kind of fiction you're seeing who the authors are I mean there are people that I know and I know from their book they're kind of snarky they see the world in a bit of a negative way like I know we're not going to be friends um just because they're, they're just not they see the world through a different lens um but um it's it, but knowing you know that it that it makes a difference in someone's lives you know i and i try i'm i the older i get the more passionate i i am about um connecting on a human level do you ever tap them on the shoulder and let them know you're the author always i always but i'm quite careful about it because i once had an, a friend of mine who is an author um, was standing in line in a bookshop in uh london and in front of them, I think it was a water stones, in front of them was somebody who was holding their book, who was going to the cash register to buy their book. And they tapped them on the shoulder and they said, excuse me, um, that's my book. And the, the woman looked at them and went, oh, fuck off. <laughs> so I have to be a bit careful. Um, but what I usually do is I get, I still get so excited. Like I can't believe, it's not, saying it in bookstores is fine, but it's that human connection when you see somebody read, and I go up and I go, I'm so sorry, I have to ask you, are you enjoying the book? And you, they're like, um, uh, and then they look at me and before they have a chance to say anything, I then have to say, I'm so sorry, but I wrote it. So I, I, you know, I still get really excited. Most people are quite overwhelmed though, if I, when I go over. And then in the old days, I used to see them, um, I used to see them like very furtively flip to the back of the book to the author picture, just to make sure. How does it make you feel today knowing you reached the ultimate mile marker for any author of becoming a household name and that you have your own section either in bookshelves at stores or in people's homes? So I'm not aware of, of being part of pop culture anymore, but certainly back in the day, um, you know, I'd, I'd be sent books all the time. They'd say it's like it's a cross between, you know, X and Jane Green and for all, lo all people who love Jane Green. And that was just amazing I mean just it, it's amazing and and I also think that I you know for years I I had that sort of imposter syndrome where I just didn't feel that I deserved it or was good enough and that it was just a lucky fluke and so on the one hand you you feel enormously flattered and on the other hand you just think well it's not real I don't deserve that it doesn't mean anything with my very first books with straight talking there was a lot of press around the book and, yeah. and that, so I'd been on the other side. I was always the journalist and all of a sudden I was being interviewed and, 
and I remember feeling very exposed and very vulnerable. And I, I remember doing um, the Daily Mail, did a big piece. And I remember they, they wanted a photograph of me lying on a chaise in a red evening dress. Oh, no. Surrounded by a bunch of, of male models in, in black tie, feeding <laughs> me grapes and champagne. One of the great joys of, of being this age and still writing is that I really know who I am now. I didn't know who I was earlier. I was trying to be someone else. I think my writing was always, has always been authentic because that's actually how I've, how I express myself. Um, but now I'm able to bring that authenticity to everything. Like who you see is, this is me. I'm, I'm not being anyone else. I'm, I'm very honest. I'm very down to earth. Um, and, and I, I like that I'm, I'm leading a really authentic life now. And so, um, yeah, I'm never going to be coerced into doing a, a photo shoot in an evening gown again. Any books within your wonderful catalog you'd like to be remembered for writing? Um, so my, my, yes, my favorites of my book, well, Jemima has to be in there because, Jemima just, it was such a lovely fairy tale and it changed so many people's lives, including mine. Um, so yeah, Jemima's in there. The Beach House is in there because um, it was the first, you know, it was the first book I wrote after I'd met the man, my landlord, who's now my husband. And it was the first time that I really understood what a happy ending might look like. And so, and, and so I, I brought that to the book in a way I was never, ever able to. And in fact, if you think, you know, a lot of my earlier books featured women who were married, but desperately unhappy and they couldn't figure out why, which of course, with hindsight, you know, that was me. Um, so The Beach House, um, I love the Sunshine Sisters because those girls, those characters, the sisters, jumped off the page from the from the get-go and they were all so different and so distinctive and I I they Lizzie made me laugh all the time um Nell who who you know is, ends up being the secret lesbian you know it was just a fantastic journey um I I really love the Sunshine Sisters and then you know my number one actually maybe I don't know yet because I'm not going to know until I finish it but right now I'm loving writing this book more than I've loved ever writing a book in my life, so. Finally, before we wrap up this truly memorable conversation, does it ever blow your mind to think that 10 million people around the world have read your books and that you've had that kind of impact? But look, the truth is, my life is so small. I mean, it, you know, my life is, is me working, writing in my office, cooking for my kids and my husband. You know, I have great friends here in, in Connecticut. You know, I go out with the girls. Um, I tune it out. I mean, really, it's not real. Do you know, it doesn't actually, I mean, if I stop to think about it and really take it in, which is very hard for me to do, you know, it's like compliments are very hard. I think I, I think that in some ways it almost just doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's me. I mean, really, I, I'm, I'm just living my sort of quite quiet life here. So it sounds like your advice to other authors hoping to reach the same peak is to tune everything else out but the love of writing along the way. What's coming up for fans of Jane Green before we go? I definitely would, would with my, with my, my writing part with Emily, I, I would love to, to be doing screenplays. But actually, I just, right now, you know, I've spent a long time like, oh, should I be doing movies and TV and all these different things? But right now, I'm just passionate about writing. The thing, and I think really that's where my focus has to be and 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 i am writing something very different in many ways it is a, it is very much my kind of book but it, it's the first time that i've really this is sort of almost historical fiction it's the late 60s mm. and it's london and marrakesh and it, it it's a mixture of fictitious people and real people and and so there's, I've done so much research. My bibliography is now three pages long and growing all the time. Um, and, and from, you know, reading Timothy Leary and, and Yves Saint Laurent, the Gettys and Anita Pallenberg and Cecil Beaton and, you know, all these characters who are around then. And I've just, everything I read just, just wakes me up a bit more. And, and so, you know, that's my, so my, that's, book one and I already and and in researching this story I came across I came across the the other story of of the Beatles 
um, in the 60s after Brian Epstein committed suicide. Kind of, he was such a father figure for them that they were all left a bit stranded. And they kind of all attached themselves to the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, um, who was this, you know, guru living in India. And they went off to India to the ashram. And um, of course, when they got there, they found this sort of quite cheerful little man who was spiritual, but also talked an awful lot about buying gold Rolls Royces. And and I, so my second book is about somebody who gets caught up in that, in, in this sort of trip to, to the ashram. Jane, thanks so much again for your time. You were really one of the first authors that signed on to the show when the concept was being pitched around. We really appreciate you being a part of About the Authors TV.